Little hand says it's time to rock and roll. Bring the noise. So Brendan team. Five, four, three, two, one, go. Good evening, folks, and welcome to the new, latest, first ever of the season, Ethan's podcast for season 24-25. My name is Desi Mond, and welcome back, everyone. I am very glad to report that tonight, so far, we have Hector Bandido and the suburbs. Good evening, Hector. Good evening, guys. Thank you. And the reason I'm coming to Hector first is we can't guarantee Ralph will actually be able to hear us. Stuck in a stuck in a car somewhere. All I can see is his cigarette. <laughs> Good evening, Ralph Mallet. How are you doing? You okay? Welcome back. Welcome. There's been a lot of people worried about you when you weren't producing the diary, but hopefully you can get that back up and running now that you've escaped our big yeah. businesses' clutches. <laughs> yeah, it's been an interesting week or two. Yeah, one well, welcome back, welcome back, Ralph, and welcome back, everyone. We do hope that Monty C. Burns can join us. He, he was based literally around half an hour ago, and now he's disappeared. So he's maybe away counting his money somewhere, so he may be a while. Uh, but if he joins, that's great. If not, we'll discharge on. So, the last time we spoke, I think, was maybe this been about cup final. We did the double, uh, and we all headed off into a nice welcome summer. It was going to be lovely. I think, Hector, we'll be talking maybe 60 to a possible £100 million in the bank, depending on where we read, and we all thought it was going to be a great summer. So in a, in a sentence, Hector, before mm. we got into the details, in one sentence, how would you sum up this summer from a Celtic perspective? Um, I would say, I was slightly disagree with what you said there, because we're old in the tooth, we know how Celtic operate. So I would say a very familiar Celtic uh, summer. Very good. Uh, Ralph, I, I was going to literally say same old, same old. So that, that ties in that. Ralph, would you say the same? Have you been shocked, Ralph? We're not going to go into details until I come into the subjects. But so far, same old, same old for you? No, it's just what you expect from them. So you can't be shocked. You can't be surprised. There's no point in getting your hopes up. And at least then if they do do something right. It's a nice wee surprise going into the season. True. So but, yeah. Plus, so, so there we are. As well as that, good players, good players we're two, way up their options. So we're, two minutes in, we're two minutes in and we're saying it's a hope that kills you. So that's a great way to start the season. Right, so I'm going to start. We're, we're going to go back to come forward. Let's go back a little bit of come forward. Uh, for this summer, it was a, a slight different this summer. We had the Euros and we had COVID Celtic, Celts and ex Celts Hector at the Euros and CONCAF. It wasn't, a, it wasn't necessarily great tournaments. I think Alistair Johnson probably did best at them all, to be brutally honest. He seemed to have a couple of good games for Canada. But overall, the Euros... Was Euros that was bit, disappointing. Nah. Wasn't it? Overall, as a spectacle, um, you could really say the best two teams met in the quarters when it was Spain and Germany were the two best teams, yeah. really, weren't they? And Austria, I think, a wee nod towards Austria. And, and Monty's old pal, Ralph. Uh, as a manager in there somewhere I had them playing some really great <laughs> attacking football but thankfully uh, Scotland got put out in the group stages who we were fucking shite do you know what see see after that Scotland should park have been sacked right Scotland should have been banned banned for at least two more tournaments from the qualifying just just sorry you don't deserve you don't deserve to go there to, to play a style of football that made Walter Smith right, Andy, look like Andy a football. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it was just, just bear it out. Germany, I can take Germany pumping this because they, they were probably, people wrote off Germany weirdly before it and Germany turned out really, really good. But to get to the last game, now let's just, I mean, to get to the last game against a team who is comparable with you and if you win, you're through. <laughs> it just passes the ball at the back. For the entirety of 45 minutes. And then after 80 minutes, now let's just bear us 80 minutes here. 80 minutes, right? He then decides. Unleashed help. Put on Lewis Morgan, who hasn't <laughs> fucking played a game in Scotland <laughs> in about 25 years, right? <laughs> and then he's got it, but 
he still does a like for like. He takes off a striker and brings on a striker. And you think, for fuck's sake, you even get to half time. You've got a second half, throw a couple of wingers, have a fucking go. Any Disney. And by the way, thank fuck we didn't get that stonewall penalty when Armstrong was pulled down because we, we, we embarrassed that tournament. Steve Clark, shame on you. Shame in Scotland. Get the fuck. <laughs> Get up, he's, and by the way, finally for me, thank fuck for Spain. Because if they cunts who were the second worst team in the tournament fucking won it, played, <laughs> what does that tell you? Steve Clark and Gareth Southgate playing the same shite style of football. And thank fuck Spain, Spain stopped them in their anti football push. Anyway, fuck it. What a push. So it was a bit disappointing for you. Is that what you're saying? You didn't enjoy it then. <laughs> 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 Uh, what were you, what were you, Ralph? Again, I, I was, I, I was kind of trying to pay attention to the excels like Big Van Dyke. He didn't recover his sell any glory. Uh, Juranovic, he again, I think he caused Croatia's last goal for the same day. So none of them seem to actually have a real deal. Frimpong, I was disappointed for Frimpong. But yeah, again, he like about the same idea. It was like we need a goal. Right on you go, we man, and he's gone. I need forty minutes to warm up. You can't just. It's not like he's going to sell bunny. You just can't go beyond. Schmeichel was brilliant. <laughs> oh, that's right. Right, we'll come to him. Hey. He's probably been the start, but yeah, but there again. So what? I think, the highlights, Ralph. One of the true highlights. Ralph. I think the highlights was Joe Hart getting an, an analysis gig. Yeah, that's what I thought. 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 Hey, obviously, you could, I watched the games on the telly. Uh, the first one, you expected to get hammered. The second one, for about 20 minutes in the second half, we seemed to play as a team. We seemed to want to win it. And you thought, you know, we could get a result here. We've got a draw. But we could win this. And we could suddenly be looking at, like, a qualification. And I, I genuinely thought we were starting to grow into the tournament. The players had settled in. And they were starting to express themselves, and then in the Hungary game, it just went straight back to the beginning. Didn't it didn't even look like they wanted to be there. The mine in the old days, you would say you need somebody to put their foot in the ball and grab the game by the scruff of the neck. There was none of that. They were fair to it. They were fair to do anything with. It. And then, well, we got what we deserved again. Simple yeah, right. as that. But again, I, like, I think that I think that but, watch, watching forward. the English stumble through doing the same thing was just embarrassing. Bit, so then, so then, but as optimism grows in England, especially you're in the heartland of Tommy Robinson land. How was it? Was was the flags were the flags up early, or did they start to grow? No, it, it was different this time because they they would watch their game and it was the same thing. They admit, they said they were shy. They didn't expect to to get as far as they did, and when they did, you'd get about maybe 20 minutes after the game we were in the pubs watching it with them and you'd get maybe 20 minutes after the game with the old footballs coming home and the usual shite and then you'd, you'd catch them talking to each other and it's like they knew they were riding their luck and they knew it was going to run out sooner or later and the way the draw worked and they never played anybody not that there was anybody in the tournament bar Spain, Germany and maybe Turkey that were worth watching the, it was dreadful it, it, Everything, every bit of individuality, every bit of excitement had just been coached out. Uh, the bank people were more interested in getting the advertising in, getting the TV figures in, than they were in actually putting on a tournament. Right, here's, here's, depressing. A que- here's a question for you, uh, Hector. Where did you watch the final? Because I think you'll be hard to beat me on. You go, where did you watch it? I think it was in the news. It was so good, it's hard to. What about you, Ralph? Where did you watch it? Uh, I think it was in the house. Uh, yeah, I would have stayed in the house. Because okay. I wouldn't have wanted to be out okay. if the unthinkable had happened. So I want you to close your eyes and use your mind's eye. I watched it in the lovely Hollander Hotel in St. Petersburg at a pool party with 20 lesbians. There's, there's, a, there's a mental image for you. Thanks to wee Michelle for the Hollander Hotel who came up to me and she's like, Sir, can I get you a drink? And I'm like, I'll have a beer. Could you could you do my favour? She loves that. I was like, see one of the tellies behind the bar. This is sitting outside at the pool park. You couldn't have put the Spain game on for me, could you? Hold on a second. Next minute, up comes Fox, and it was Peter Smeichel was that analyst. He's Celtic tie on. He had a green Celtic tie on. 
Peter Schmeichel is doing the analyst, but you, you're just reading the subtitles. The, the, the tunes were too loud to actually hear the telly, but that was lovely, watching it in the sunshine. But the main question, don't be, the main question is, <laughs> were, were, they, were they Spanish supporting lesbians or English supporting lesbians? Oh, there, there was a few, there was a few, <laughs> there was a few guys at the corner, of the, 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 like the kind of you of the bar, kind of, but again, they were about 20 feet away from me, it was a big bar, and I was kind of going, do you walk around there just to get an idea, and then every now and again, a couple would come up, so you're, they were merely your kind of Spanish flavour, they are merely your kind of Spanish flavour, but again, Americans don't really care about the football, you know what I mean? They, but they, I was talking about the lesbians. Aye, they, but the lesbians were American too, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, so they were, they were paying my attention to the other lesbians in the pool, Rather than the, the game, but they were they were coming up to the bar and I was sitting at the bar watching the game. So that was that was a nice that was a nice experience. And then at that then that night of, or one of the nights, I went mean, to one of the pubs in St Petersburg and I was pinging our friend Dominic Diamond on Twitter about this. I walked in and it was Canada versus Uruguay, I think, were playing, and there was three wee three wee guys shouting Vamos Uruguay, Vamos Uruguay. And they were all wearing Real Madrid strips. Like, I'm in an Irish bar in Florida watching Uruguay versus Canada. <laughs> Three wee guys in Real Madrid strips are saying, Vamos Uruguay and Canada score, right, to go 2 1 up. And this big Asian guy, Asian looking guy, st- it was six foot five, stones up at his bar stool and starts singing, Oh Canada, with his hand on his heart. I swear, I'm like, this is surreal. And the three wee, three wee Uruguay, so then, so I don't know if you saw the game, the Suarez scored in the last minute to equalise. The three wee guys have went mental, but it was all good fun. But I'm, I pinged on the diamond and we like, uh, I see, football, are, any of, football, the are any of those language. people in the room with you now? Football, the universal Are language. any of the people in the room with you now? It's, a, it's strange, but, but then again, see, that's what was probably missing from the, the Euro tournament. Was that wee bit of difference, that wee bit of a story that you can tell about it after? Because yeah. it was all kind of format, it was all predictable, it was just ah, dull. That, and that, there was and that nothing, there wasn't even any, apart from Scotland fans, there was nothing to talk about over there either. Yeah, the 2014 it was just, it was just dull. dull. It? The, 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 like, yeah. again, only four teams going out in the first round and we would be the first one, so to speak, no, that can I get. <laughs> Right there, right. So, so that that was the Euros. So again, we thought, right, we'll get the Euros out of the way, and then the transfers can ramp up, right? But before we get to talk about transfers, we also had our North American tour. So we'll come in that in a second. But in the same time, Ralph, the news broke that perhaps Rangers ground would not be ready for the season starting, and then suddenly all these talk of. Possible asbestos, possible rack, possible steel no coming for, che- uh, for Chelsea. That's a long way for, for steel no coming <laughs> for China. So what do you think about that, Ralph? The fact that they're not telling the truth is always going to lead to speculation. Allegedly. And I remember I found something back in an old diary about they were putting nets up underneath the stadium roof after a game against us back in 2016, because there was bits falling off it. And then they didn't do it because it became public knowledge. There's obviously been problems with the place for a long time, and they've obviously not had the money or the will to fix it. And the, there must have been something this summer that they had to fix, because they wouldn't do it if they didn't have to. And I think they found something, or they found either a structural problem, or it's that, you know, that concrete that all the schools are made out of. The it, aerated it, concrete. Yeah, you're right. There's is something it, there that has to be fixed, otherwise at least one of the same, three of the stands would be open. Sorry, apologies. Is it the same problem whereby you can't even put your car window up? Is it the same problem as that? Well, I don't know. Ah, no, no. This day we keep getting the traffic going by, so we can't actually hear what you're saying. Oh, he's away again, right? So I managed to lose Ralph, so that was, that was good. He's owned the door of the fucking cars. <laughs> door. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Oh. So, yes. So, so, so Rangers are now renting Hamden for the foreseeable future. It's meant to be for a few weeks, 
But, Ralph, what's your prediction? We'll move on quickly for this, but that was a nice wee twist in there. I think there's a lot more going on than what we're talking, than what we hear and what we feel. Uh, If there's a a structural... If there was only just that one stand, they would open the other three because it'll cost them money to do it. And, uh, and of course, the guys that have bought season books for Ibrox, I believe something will be coming out soon that they've got to pay extra you go to Hamden, where are they going to be sitting? Will they get an equivalency? It's a massive mess. And obviously our intrepid uh, mainstream media are avoiding all the questions that should be asked. Mm-hmm. I don't think that place will open before Christmas. And I think we've got uh, there's m- more to come in that story, as they say. Yeah, well, okay. We'll Sooner or later, happens. somebody's going to let it go. Yeah, we'll see what happens with the New Year game. Right, so moving forward, apologies for taking so long on that. Moving forward, pre-season and the... Uh, Pre-season friendlies and also the US Tour. Hector, as our resident tactician, uh, Queen's Park game, uh, lots of goals, and also Air United to kick off the season. Uh, lots of goals, and then we went to America and we cuffed Man City, cuffed Chelsea, cuffed DC United. As our resident tactician, how impressed have you been with our actual form? Well, Daisy, what I would say first of all when you say we went to America... <laughs> Let me tell our listener a story here, right? So, so, so Desi being, as you, you guys at follow us on Twitter, being the shy, unassuming type who never, ever gets involved in any style of debate or conversation, right? Our, our young Desi here, I use the term Desi, young Desi very loosely, went to not only Florida and Tampa Bay with a lesbian pool parties, unbeknown to his wife, his good wife, right? She was there, my wife was there, also, my wife was there. Ah, also, he also... <laughs> He also, believe it or not, went to Washington, D.C., not just on the day of the game, but the night before the game, and he went to the match itself. So, Desi, rather than coming to me, Desi, tell us all about your Washington, D.C. experience. Oh, it, 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 it's fantastic. Uh, pure, a pure fluke. I might have mentioned it in the previous podcast. A pure fluke. I'd booked, we'd booked a holiday, Florida and New York, to go and see Super Billy Joe's last, last gig. Uh, and then I said to my wife, it would be nice to stop off from Washington, and she went, OK, then, we'll do it for the weekend. Six months later, Celtic announced the tour, and just by chance, they're in Washington the same weekend. So we caught up with Callum and the Washington D- uh, Washington Celtic Supporters Club, as you remember. I uh, had a good chat with him, what the plans were, so we went to there. So we arrived, and we arrived in Washington on the Friday, jumped up to Callum's pub, uh, Four Crowns, uh, easy enough to get to if anyone's ever in Washington. Jumped up there, it was rammed. It was absolutely a couple of hundred folk easy. It was absolutely jumping. The night before, they had Roy Aitken and the trophies in in a QA. and uh, a So they did a, that was really good. And then it came to the day of the game, the morning of the game, the Saturday of the game. So me and my wife did a tour of the Senate building. That was fine. Walking down for the Senate building to go get changed, to go to the rooftop party. Don't mind, I hope I'm not making anybody jealous here. Uh, and there's a wee Celtic fan walking in front of us, right? That's, 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 uh, you can just see the hoops in front of you, and the guy's heading towards our hotel. We were staying in the Phoenix Park, and there'd been a few Celtic fans. So you're walking line thinking, he's gone to your hotel, and he stops, looks in a doorway, and walks into this doorway. So it turns out it was this new cafe, corner bakery it was called, this new place for food, restaurant, opening up. So... My wife's like, oh, are you hungry? One of when we walk in, stands in the queue behind this wee guy in the cell. And the guy, the guy says to him, have you got an invite? And he hands this flyer there. And then the man says to us, have you got an invite? We're like, no, no, we never knew. It's fine. He went, I can invite you. So not only did we get to go and watch sell it, but we got a free lunch in Washington on the day of the game. So that was a nice way to start your day. The guy basically said, pick anything you like. This is just a, a training day. So there's us. So I had a chat with I had a chat with a wee guy who's, he came down, he was Scottish, but he came down from New York, so he knew he came down for Jack Dempsey's, so uh, we all know people from the Manhattan Fenian boys, so I was looking forward to catching up with Stevie and family from there later on. So he goes back, gets changed, jumps up to the hotel, the Cambria Hotel, and Eddie and Chris from the Philly Boys, they'd organised a brilliant rooftop party. Right, so we arrived maybe an hour and a half after it started, I get up the lift, we get up the lift, walks out the lift, it's mobbed, but in a good way, everybody's outside and inside, goes to the bar, and the guy's like, you're as well going downstairs, they've ran out of beer. 
the hotel the hotel for it was 300 American fans coming to a game, i.e. driving, whereas it was 300 real Celtic fans coming to the game from everywhere. So I met people from New York, I met people from uh, Canada, I met people from Upper State New York, as you know, near, near the border. Uh, I met people from Philadelphia, met people from Dundee. I mean, like, people, had, people had flew in from here, there and everywhere. It was absolutely brilliant. And then we go to the game itself, there was a big beer gardens outside, had a cracking day, uh, outside, eventually got into the ground, and you could walk about anywhere you like. You didn't need to sit in your seat. You could walk, but, but you could tell that the stewards did not have a clue of the, like, what the UCL fans were like. They expected your kind of standard wee MLS fans to turn up with a day, a picnic day, you know that way. And it was the selling fans shouting. Buckled. Aye, they, they shouting. It was like I think it was. Uh, I think I was sixty dollars for four drinks. Roughly, that's the way it worked out. You were getting the big cans, but you were constantly. It was just people constantly shouting. The guy, you know, like the the hot dog guy, back scratcher, and family guy. This guy walking about with the cold beers. <laughs> over here, mate. Over here. Over here. And it was just brilliant. I mean, and then we walked in the ground. This is the first goal we went in, and the whole place was jumping. It was excellent. And then we came out of that, and the baseball was on the same night, and the stadiums are literally across the road for each other. So rather than face pandemonium at the tube and stuff, we just went into a, a big bar next to the, I think it's the Nationals, the baseball team. We yeah, went into this big, sport, massive, massive big sports bar, and it was jumping with both baseball and Celtic fans. And then the whole the whole place, for, I was like, I think about two in the morning we finished, and then back to our Irish bar next to the hotel, and that was still jumping. So it was fantastic. Next day was so see, a, so see, a lazy day. So, so see when you see you at the ground, I remember back to the podcast we did with Callum, right? Uh-huh. And Callum, I think if I remember rightly so, had kind of fairly low expectations yeah. based upon the disappointing tour the last time. Yeah. And I remember us saying to him at the end of it, I think you're in for a surprise with the number of Celtic fans that's going to be here. Did he did he get that this uh, time? Was he surprised? Well, Were they surprised? Well, I I, I yeah, I, I think Judging by that four crowns pub, it was it was mobbed. I mean, it was like mobbed. You walked in, and I think hopefully touch wide, they hopefully they they made a good wee bit of money off it, and a good way. I mean, like they got all this entertainment, and they got the club involved and stuff. So they done a lot. But round about the ground itself, they also had like merchandise. And so remember, he said they hadn't even brought over one thing. So the club have obviously invested a wee bit this time, and they did have merchandise, and they did have basically stalls and. Uh, basically booths and stuff to actually try and promote the club. So they'd put, maybe they've listened to him. So many, how many fans do you would you, I know it's hard, won't you? But at the match itself, how many how many Celtic fans thousands? A couple well, of thousand I, more I, than that? I, well, I think they'd say I'd be guessing it say ten seventy, ten thousand or so. I think they were estimating about eight. As many as that oh, it's game a game it, it just seemed like a Celtic game. It was like Aye. it was like literally mind me and you went to Liverpool. And suddenly, when Celtic scored, remember, and suddenly all the Celtic fans appeared from anywhere. Uh, it was, it was like that. Uh, Celtic scored, and the whole place went up. You know what I mean? So, as I say, you can go anywhere you want. Once you're in the ground, you're in the ground. So, did you get did you get uh, an impression for any of the locals during the game, or, or after the game, or in the hotel? About was there anything spoken about the numbers coming to Washington who were not NFL or? No, nah, I, don't, I, I don't. I don't think there'll be many converts again. As I've mentioned before, the into Miami thing is massive everywhere. That is that is soccer in America. Messi is Messi, so, Messi uh, is soccer in America. That's the be all and end all, really. Uh, as I think, so I don't think they have converted many. But I think it would have really reinforced the younger generation of the people who went to see it with their, like, their Selic dad. Like, there was loads of Selic families there. You know, like, people have came from everywhere. Like, there was hundreds came down from New York and hundreds came down from, like, uh, North, higher North America, like Canada and uh, where else? Like, even Florida. Like, people were coming up yeah. from the South. So, again, but they were coming with their families. This wasn't a bunch of boys. There wasn't a bunch of guys in a day out. I mean, it was Cause like... Cause because part of the reason I asked, and you, you guys know this, right? So my, my oldest boy and family came to Scotland while Celtic were in the States. It was just a big family do, and it would been booked well in advance. And he doesn't just live in the States, as you guys know, he lives in North Carolina. Mm-hmm. So of all places, Chapel Hill, where we played game number two against Man City, for him that was easy to get to. He'd have been at that game. So he has he's a coach. 
So he coaches the younger generation of Americans. So they're, they're right into it. The younger generation are right into it. You can imagine over there, Celtic coming, he's just saying to them all, Celtic, Celtic. So, and all they get is the EPL. You yeah. know, in terms of watching football on TV, it's EPL. It's what we will EPL. Champions League's on, they'll get that. So he's been talking and talking and talking. It was interesting. When we played in Chapel Hill, and obviously, I know it was a piece of friendly, but beat Man City 0-3. The messages he was getting with people over there, Americans, wow, mm-hmm. wow, you know, and it was just, it was just good to hear. So he's now, now back there and amongst, and amongst them again. But I think what he was saying, because North Carolina is an interesting place. It's, it's more a college state rather than Washington D.C. or, or well, yeah. Chicago. Well, mm-hmm. that's not traditional North Carolina, right? Yeah. But, but North Carolina is more a, it's more a college state in terms of sports, where basketball in particular. So Chapel Hills, where Michael Jordan, North Carolina, played. I think Brendan was there. And, met the North Carolina coach when he was there. So it's just interesting just seeing the younger generation, him coaching there, our club going there. And I think he was saying that already there's some real positive vibes coming from North Carolina about the impression mm-hmm. Celtic did. Because, again, you see a bigger stadium, I think it held 50,000. It wasn't a sellout, obviously. But there must have been between five to 10,000 Celtic fans. And it wasn't, you know, American fans who are just like a European team. It was Celtic supporters, as you were saying, similar to Washington, D.C. Then the yep. third game in Notre Dame, it was if that was the biggest turnout of the lot. That's 100,000 stadium. There must be 10,000 plus there. So yeah. I'm not a big fan of pre-season. You know, I've not been to a pre-season game for years and years. But even I'll admit, watching, watching the highlights, watching the fans' involvement, watching the publicity, watching the performances, it's got to be as good um, a pre-season in terms of preparation, but also selling the club. Overseas, I think there's been a very long time. Yeah, I, I was really shocked at the quality of the football itself, you not know, like the speed they were playing at. Again, yeah, so, because thankfully the heat died down a bit, because a few weeks before the games, it had been like 100 degrees. There'd been a severe heat warning for like weeks in Washington, but it kind of dropped towards the 80s. And I know that, but it had been raining that day also, so it kind of, it was a, it was your typical Glasgow summer night, if that mean, mean it was like, Kind of a wee bit humid, but it was it was bearable rather than being unbearable. And it, the rain stopped before the game. It was raining during the rooftop party, but we didn't mind. Uh, and then the game itself, that was fine. But then they continued that with other games. But the actual speed, like especially O'Reilly and Kyogo, I mean, like they've they've been they've been right out the blocks. That it usually it takes a good couple of games to actually kind of get up to speed and stuff. But they seem to be right on it. And then we come to during that, we had the signing of Casper Michael. So let's just come on to that while we're here, because he came out during that tour. And when we signed Michael, Ralph, what was your initial thoughts? Because from your perspective, I know Hector was very uh, and happy with it, as, as in when it got announced. I was very sceptical, as in, is this the best we can do? Somebody who's older than Joe Hart, and given the, type, given the fact that we'd had since May to find a replacement for Joe Hart, I did say if this is part of a succession plan, and the next day we did, I did say, I did have that caveat, it would be worthwhile, and we did sign, uh, I don't, Viljami Sinisalo for Aston Villa to finish keeper, so that was good the next day. But Michael himself, Ralph, what was your thoughts when you, that was announced, and then his subsequent game so far, because he's put in some performances. I was going to, well, they're the good heroes. They, they, he looks like he can still play the game. That's as high a level as you can play at. He did well. Uh, I think if you if you cast your mind back to when Joe Hart came in, we, we needed somebody like him at the back to kind of organise things. And if we were to sign somebody that wasn't as experienced as that, we could have been struggling all over again. So I thought it was a good move. And it was an even better move getting in a promising young keeper that he can work with for either 12 months or 24 months depending on how, how he holds out. Yeah, but yeah it's very encouraging. Like and it is quality, yeah. which is what he's been looking for. I think Ralph hit the nail <laughs> the head there because when you get an older keeper again, there's obviously, you look at, well, Joe's left and Joe was, what, 37, whatever, 36, 37. And then we replaced Joe with a guy slightly older, a few months, a year, whatever, older. But but Ralph's point spot on. This was not a guy who'd been sitting on a bench or in a stand for three years. This is a guy playing as the number one keeper for a, a, a really good Danish international team at the Euros. 
So he has a quality. I mean, he has an absolute quality keeper. And and what's been really interesting is everything he's said off the pitch and everything he's done on the pitch, appreciate his very early days, has been so impressive. His communication, he's turned about his conversations with Brendan, about his conversations with Joe, didn't realise how tight yep. him and Joe Hart were going way back to the Man City days when they're both young keepers. And he just seems to ooze that uh, leadership, but also he's a bit, you can see this desire he wants to win. I want to come and win. I want, I want something what Joe had, and yeah. I want that. I realise I'm 37, I want someone in the next couple of years. And it was interesting that he did a media conference, it was yesterday, and he was kind of almost saying that, although it's a one-year, a one-year option, he's the intention of quitting in 12 months' time. So it's very early days, but I, I'm just thinking, so the succession plan is brilliant. This this guy, for people who, who don't know we've got for the love, I want to be a bit of a watch here with this guy. He's the Finnish international keeper, number one keeper. And he was in loan with Exeter. Oh, Finnish. He's English. only 22. <laughs> no, I know. The English <laughs> League One team. And he was he was voted as their player of the year. But I always think a good a good gauge of how players are is when you go into some of the forums and, and, and just read some of the comments. And I did that. I looked at not just Exeter, who voted them as their player of the season. Aston Villa fans were going nuts that, that they weren't retaining this guy. Yeah. They were saying, what, what are we doing here? We better have a buyback clause to get this guy. So everything about succession planning, also it turns out that his, his kind of, one of his keeper idols is Schmeichel. He's got a chance to work with him for either 12 months or 24 months, then take over. What usually be then, 24, 25? Yeah. I think it's really an unusual thing for Celtic. It's really good planning in terms of our goalkeeper. Really good planning. Yeah. Uh, and and Michael, because if, if Schmeichel does get injured or he's, his age goes against him and loses fitness, you've got somebody that can come in and has done it at a decent level as well. Yeah, not hope. to the same level, but somebody, you know, they, we can, well, it's no Scott Bain, and that makes me feel good anyway. Oh, yeah, I'll come to that in a second, but yeah, exactly. We're, we're hoping, again, we're only fans, so we just we make assumptions that we don't really know are grounded in reality, football wise. We assume, I was going to say, you assume he'll do the cup games. You no, know, that way it'll be like the, the kind of way the date in England will start actually blooding people in the cup games, and then if we get to the final, then that's when you make a question of, do you go with your first, first team or whatever? Hopefully he does get some exposure. There's no just sitting on his ass for a year and then suddenly, wait a minute, we've only got 60, 12 months left. But fingers crossed, all going well. Uh, Smiko, as you mentioned, Hector uh, had, a, had a press conference or two and I like the fact they said he was impressed by the send-off his pal Joe Hart got last season. Like He watched, he watched the end of season games, he watched the cup final and he said he was really impressed and he, and he was really grateful. He said, this is Smiko because he thinks Hart got the send off he deserved, his career deserved, rather than like seeing it out sitting on a Spurs bench or a Burnley bench or whatever, West Ham bench. And he says, Smiko, he was happy working under Brendan, so he, he was happy when Brendan's given him this opportunity, and he's here to help this club keep winning. So he's already got that, that mentality. But Hector, from your tactician perspective, how good is he with the ball at his feet? It's, it's been, so that's it's the big, outstanding. That's the that's the big thing we we we, we know just Joe, but other good mm-hmm. keepers. Yep. Like Craig Gordon was a great short stopper as well. But Gordon's weakness was always you know the ball in his feet. And Joe was okay, but but I but Joe Joe he's on a mission. It was a thing he he, he he got better at compared to the game changed a lot the last ten years. But as Schmeichel, he's always been strong at his feet. But you can see already in pre-season the ball he's zipping it at pace. Mm-hmm. 20 yep. metre pass, he's pinging them straight to feet. He's firing about. He looks like an oh. actual, a, an accomplished outfield player with the ball at his feet. And the thing is, we have what that helps us is that if a team's trying to press us to bypass the press, which might not happen so much domestically, probably more for Europe, that's a really positive thing for us. And I also think domestically, with teams are low block, he'll come out high with the ball at his feet and he'll, he'll commit players. And he'll spread it to the defenders, the fullbacks, the the low line midfielders as well. So I think that's a big, a big improvement for us having a keeper that's going to be so so comfortable. With the ball at his feet. Yep, yep. So that was that was that. And again, he so he turned up, played a couple of games, had a great game against was it Man City? I think one either Man City or Chelsea. Nine saves, I think it was. But the distribution. Both of them is it no? Is it no? Both distribution is fantastic. Distribution. Yeah. Right. Before we move on from the US, two, I'm just going to. So a big shout out to Eddie and Chris at the Philly boys. 
uh, for all the work and giving me a t-shirt. But I did pass the t-shirt on to a mate, a barman from Philadelphia, a wee guy, and he basically loved the Philly Celts t-shirt. So I gave him that after the game. So I did pass that on. Uh, John and Debbie for the Saratoga Springs uh, Supporters Club. Stevie, Linda and all the guys at Manhattan, uh, the Manhattan Fenians, and Ralph now has a Manhattan Fenian boys uh, T-shirt that you can wear. Thank game. you very much for that. It's brilliant. Can, it's brilliant. We, Thanks. Because with Stevie, I met a guy, Chris, who basically said, are you the guy that does the diary? I went, no, that's an R guy. He's like, what happened to you? I went, oh, I'll be back. He's, he's, left, he's left his job, so he'll be coming back. So you've got the T-shirt now, Ralph. And a special shout out to Del Boy and the Dundee contingent. They basically came over for the week. They were in Washington for a week, but they were just there for sale. And there was loads of folk, not just your Paul, the Tim of the world, there was loads of folk who made it their, their holiday this year to go to America and just follow sell it in America. And that's no mean feat, and it's not cheap. I mean, so fair play to everybody that made it such a success. Right, so that was the tour. So we come back to the tour, uh, and then we... Just a quick word on the exits, Hector. The, the exits, right, so we know Joe Hart retired. O goes to Genk for a couple of million. Hak Zabanovic goes to Malmo for, again, possibly a couple. But I swear to God, I think you're, just for everyone's information, Hector's flicking me the Vicky here on the video. But I actually think he'll be one of these signings. Like, remember, was it Bergen or whatever years ago, Joe? I think he'll come back and bite us in the ass at some point. He'll score a goal against us, Hacks of And then, and then, this is you mentioned, Bain, etc. there, or people who are sitting on the bench for a couple of years. Benjamin Siegvist, who I doubt any of us could identify in a usual suspect's lineup, has left the joint FC Rapid Bucharest. Right? But the most interesting departure was the day I noticed uh, Shane Mengu from the women's team, the Chinese lassie for the women's team. She's left to join Millwall. She's away to join the London Lionesses. So that kind of slipped under the radar. So I'm hoping they let her contract run out. So I'm hoping the Celtic women's team is not going down the, the road of the Celtic men's team, whereby they're, these people just disappear. Desi, there's one big name from the men's team you've no mentioned. Oh, you go. You've no mentioned. Oh, you go. And it's a, it's a weird one because it's not, I don't think it's officially been announced by the club, but he's actually gone. Is your mate from the south side of Glasgow, James McCarthy? He's, he's gone, huh? No way. Yeah, he's left, huh? Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. This, this was this was going to be his breakthrough season. No, but I've been told in very good authority that he's uh, at some. He's, he's now. I just don't know why the club's not announced it. I'm just not sure why why that is. But apparently he's gone. So there yeah, you go, so, folks. The official oh, return of Ray Miller. Ray Miller has returned for a rumour mill <laughs> exclusive. James McCarthy exit. Exit the, the, I don't even know what I was going to say. Would it be the, the clinic? Has anybody seen him? That's pure weird. Uh, so McCarthy's, so that's somebody off the wage bill. But again, I always say that I always, like the four year deal, I always believe that was a case of two year deal spreading your, your wages, two years' wages over four years on the books. That's what I always assumed that was. You know, I also love as well, seeing if saying it doesn't work out for that time, it was law of the board's fault. And any ones that were good was Angie's, you know what I mean? Right, listen, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> he, never signed, he never signed any duds out of Ange. Uh, yeah, no so, yeah, and only, only our thing, only our thing, Hector, for you, because, again, again I, I've been saluting, saluting a great man the last 24 hours. Andy Murray retired yesterday, so a oh, special shout out. One of the one of the best, one of the, one of the good yeah. guys. A good a good Hibs man, I know, but one of the good guys. So good luck. So the guys, the, the guy, the guys going out. I think, which which is kind of fair enough, right? And uh, I think we all, even we all, I think they made a club and a profit on it, which which is good, right? Um, there's a couple of loanies come back. Uh, Lawal's come back. Was it was it Fleetwood? Fleetwood, yeah, he was at Fleetwood. Man, I think he was one of the players of the year. And of all people, it was Charlie Adam who, who moved him back into his natural position in midfield. Celtic, for some reason, signed him from Watford, where he was young player of the year as a midfielder. Celtic put him to centre-half. <laughs> then Adam put him back to midfield, and he got these rave reviews. So so he's back. Brendan, I think, had some strong comments for him at home about what he expected early on in pre-season, which I think is a good thing. It's OK to do a pass, but it's, it's the hard work you've got. Yeah, the him. tough love. Uh, absolutely, especially younger players. So... He's back. Uh, obviously, we also got 
Mikey's back, but I think he's a short term. I think, to be fair to Mikey, it's an interesting one. He goes to West Brom, and by all accounts, he was sensational for West Brom for the last three, four months of the season. So I think what, what's good for us and good for him is we'll probably get some money for him from a championship club because he did so well there. So fair dues. And actually, when we're talking about that, probably Adam Eder. Norwich fans don't rate him at all. And yet, he came to us, was really, really good, actually. Probably instrumental as winning the league in the Cup, certainly getting the winning goal. But Norwich fans don't rate him. They're a championship club. So it's just funny how sometimes a player, whatever reason, doesn't work at certain clubs. So what I'm getting at is here, I, hope, I think Mikey will move on. I think some defenders that have to move out. Uh, we've got Kubayashi, I think. Well, he's just a matter of time. Lagabielka, he was going to go in January until... Who was it? Get injured? I remember he was on the plane in Italy and then get called That's back. Right. So, so part of me is thinking, Desi, we're, we're going to come to probably some of the players coming out, but I think you've also got to free up space. Because right now, we've just mentioned central defenders there. We've got the man who's always injured for Poland, who's injured again, start of the pre-season. Okay. Right, you've got Laga Bielke, Kobayashi's three, you've got Carter Vickers four, you've got Scales five. So for us Welsh. to bring in our set Welsh. Half in, Welsh, you can't, Steve you know, we've, we've, got to create, we've got to create some space. We can't just, you know, get another one or two set and a half in and suddenly we, some don't move out and we're sitting with fucking eight set and a halves. That's daft, so... I want players in as much as anybody, but at the same time, you've got to start moving some fucking players out at the same time, especially in, def- especially in certain areas, defence. But it's conversely, it's the opposite when it comes to striker. Striker's a ridiculous situation we're in right now. We've got one striker. There you are. We'll come to all that. Yeah, exactly. No, he's at perfect timing, perfect timing. I'm coming to that now. Uh, so I'll, I'll skip one, I'll come back to it. So this you mentioned there, we currently have one recognised striker, Ralph. And tonight it has been announced that Kyogo has this signed with a new agency. Do we have anything to worry about there? Or is it this one of those things? It depends which agency, doesn't it? If, uh, it's, if it's one of these great big groups of agents. Yes, it is. Maybe we have. Yeah. And would it by any chance be linked anywhere to Tottenham or something like that? Because yes, I, I find it hard to believe. They, they, that team are looking for a striker at the yeah. moment. I find it hard to believe that Postecoglou has the move for any of them yet. Um, so this, depa- this, I mean, they've sorry, all just signed new contracts the C- of the Japanese boys. CAA base. They signed for CAA base. Uh, and CAA base are a division of CAA sports representing football stars of today and tomorrow worldwide, formerly at base soccer. And all over their, their, their Twitter image, one, two, three, four Tottenham players. That's that's good of you. So guys, can I just 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 so you know, and I just googled there while while you were talking because it's came to mind. So the person who owns CEA base owns it, right? Is also Ange Postecoglou's agent, <laughs> and and he's not just Ange Postecoglou's agent. He's one of Angie's closest friends in the game. And it's a guy called Frank Trimboli, who is an Aussie as well. So, putting two and two together, right, I think we know where this one's... I'm not saying he's guaranteed to go to Spurs, but it looks as if he's been lined up to to, to sell him elsewhere. That's football, right? Yeah, yeah. Right, so, that, so, so that'll, that'll, be a, that'll be a worry if that happens, given the fact we play Rangers in four weeks. So that'll be interesting to see if Kyogo is still there in four weeks. But so that that's that's Kyogo. But Ralph, we also have the classic tale of uh do as I say, do as I say, not as I do, whereby we've got Atlanta, Atalanta, sorry, doing a Peter Lawwell by repeatedly low balling us for Matt O'Reilly. Do we think that's ever gonna go anywhere or will we manage to keep them away, keep everyone away, uh, keep everyone away? before the transfer window closes. The players made absolutely no noises about wanting to go anywhere. He's improved under Rogers. He looks like he's happy enough to improve under Rogers. And I don't understand why any club would offer a, a, a 13, 14, up to 17 million when we've already said no to 25 million last year. It doesn't make any sense. It's, I wouldn't be surprised if it was kind of made up 
not that anybody in our media would do that or anyone in any media would do that. It, it doesn't have a ring of truth to it. If they seriously wanted the player, they would surely offer at least someone near what Celtic have already turned down. It doesn't make sense. Carry on, Hector. I was just going to say, so we we mentioned before the podcast, we were talking about Rogers' interview today, and this topic was one that he brought up. He was asked about players and and how Matt Arely was coping with the speculation. And he went into a fair bit of detail about this, which was really, really, really insightful. And he basically says, look, um, having worked in in the English Premier League, he he knows the value of players. And he goes, he feels that not just Celtic, but clubs in Scotland, because it's regarded as a Scottish league, they think they get players for a lot cheaper than what they are. And he made the point, he goes, look, I've just seen players go this summer for in excess of £30 million, who in essence aren't as good as Matt Riley. And the offers we've had today for him are nowhere near, nowhere near what we'd consider if we'd sell him. And he was really, he's also talked a lot more than that, but in essence what I'm getting at is, I think Rogers made it clear to the board and, and to Matt Riley, he said, well, look, great, but this boy isn't he 15 million, 20. I think Rogers is, is really looking for closer to 30 before they consider it because he's under contract, he's 23, and importantly, he says, Matt Riley's so happy here. He's a really balanced kid. He said he's, he's learning, he's still developing, and he'll make a lot of money in his career and he'll go at the right time. But right now, as things stand, nowhere near an offer the club would consider. So that was really interesting today. I'm, I'm going to detail about that. Mm hmm. Yeah, so yeah, so it will be interesting to see what happens. They've had a few. You wonder if your leads or whatever, your, the leads or whatever will come in and try and, like a kind of club like or a West Ham, they've started signing a few people recently. There won't be leads, they're, they're skint, Desi. They're oh, well, no, but again, this skint. Sunday, something like a high championship or a, a kind of promoted, newly promoted or a kind of lower level premiership club, i.e., a club that would think 20 million, let's go and get somebody. No, like, yeah, I know West Ham have started spending a bit of money now. Leicester, again, linked with Atati, that could just be paper paper talk, the usual, just to try and stir things up. But we're, I think we're going to start. It's been very quiet. The whole transfer world has been kind of quiet up until now. So I think it's going to ramp up in the next few weeks. So it will be interesting to see. Well, Rogers, Rogers kind of mentioned that as well. He, he was saying the uh, people that did were, they were asking him, and he goes, obviously the Euros, a lot of the players are away, a lot of the, the better players are away, but he goes, it's a domino effect. He goes, in essence, because once the players then get a break, they then get back to their clubs. A lot of the clubs are in America, around the world just now, EPL clubs, etc. Once they get their squad together, then the pieces start to fall into place. Like, for example, you, your point, it might be like a West Ham or a Chelsea buy someday from Club A for £40 million. Pound. That then gives Club A cash to go and buy the player from Club B for £25 million. Pound. And you're just saying, in effect, that, that's what happens in the football. It's like, a, it's like a domino effect. Yep. And a lot of clubs don't want to sell too early because they've got a good asset. And that's why so many things happen late. Not all the time, but a lot of the time happens so late in the window. More so when there's a, a big football tournament taking place this summer. Was it, was it 24 or 32 teams this year? The biggest, the biggest ever. So it was just, and he was very, very clear about it. And, I, and can I just emphasise this? Watch it. It's on YouTube. Watch it. He was very, very positive. It wasn't him throwing mud. He was just saying, look, I know what he's going to ask me. Yes, I want quality players brought in that will enhance the first team and the squad. He goes, we've got another few weeks to do it. We're constantly trying to get them in. We've just got to recognise that sometimes you just can't get them in quick because a lot of events are taking place. But we're trying our best. It's the first time I've actually heard him say that. He basically says, and and we fully appreciate the fans' expectations with the club. We fully appreciate they want to see the best team possible on that pitch. And our duty as a club is to give that to the fans. It's the first time I've heard him say that. I mean, he spouts bullshit for a living. But he was, you could see he was just talking, as if he was having a conversation. He, he wasn't doing the, the kind of, the glint in the eye and the bullshit Brendan. He, he went into a zone for about two or three minutes talking about it. So it was just interesting. I think he's subtly put a wee bit more pressure back on the board yeah, without the exactly. the pram. But he's also emphasised <laughs> fans' expectations are the same as his expectations in terms of players coming in this year. And he also said, just, just <laughs> he basically said, look, somebody asked him, what, what's the expectation with Celtic? What, what's your targets? He goes, well, well, in essence, the targets to win 
get back the trophy that we didn't win last season, right? And win the other two, and to get through the group stages, to the knockout stages, because we've been so poor in Europe. Yeah. Because no, can I continue? Target this year is to get through the knockout stages of the Champions League. Fucking really, really top interview. You've you've got to watch this. Either right. get folk on side and go. He's he's made, he's told them, or he's bullshitting. But I think you can tell he's bullshitting. And he, he didn't seem to be bullshitting today. He was very very straight today. Aye, I think I think if Monty was on, he could give us a good interpretation of the classic uh, iron fist wrapped in a velvet glove. As you said, he was saying, "Listen, fans, uh, we're doing all we're we are doing all we can, but that we has got a limited shelf life." I mean, he has Aye. he has made it clear the players they want, and he's willing to give them up until near the end of the window. He'll work with what he's got, and we can see clear improvement already. So again, that may be enough to get us past the Rangers game, but he's wanting to ensure that by the time we get to Champions League, there is those qualities. And again, we've seen, a, even for that interview, there's been a few rumours going about the night of Celtic chatting to Antwerp and various other people. Uh, Liverpool, uh, the young boy Beck, so I think that was the day. So we'll wait, and see. Back, we'll wait and see. But again, but well, during the American tour, when all, when all the questions were starting, I've just made a note of the quotes here. This is Brendan. Well, I had a long meeting with Michael and Chris today, finance director. Uh, so we know the we know the targets we want to bring in. There's still a long way to go in the window. So again, he's giving them a little bit of rope and saying, fair enough. Uh, I think my concentration is that we know what we want to do. We know the priority positions that we want to improve. I think you've echoed quite a few of those, Hector. Uh, whilst the club got on with that, myself and the coaches are really focused on the improvement of this team. So that's good to hear, and that's been a bit evident. So at some point before the end of August, right, so this is, this is him on the 20, this is him on the 24th of July saying that, and you say he's backed up a day. So at some point before the end of August, I would expect us to have the players we want in. I'll make it clear to the Celtic supporters, we know we want to improve the squad, and by the end of the window, and... And by the end of the window, I expect to do that. I expect us to do that. So as you can see there, he's already, that was last week. He was already sowing that seed of, right, I'm backing you to back me. You know what I mean? So, and we all know, if it comes to the end of the window and we're still getting told these things take time, blah, 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 I would assume that Rogers is going to come in and say, well, but he will not say it in the words, but what do you expect me to do? You know what I mean? I, I can only give them the targets and they'll go to execute those targets. Signed. I think what would be, what would be good, sorry, Ralph, I know we would be waffling a wee bit, and, uh, but I think what would be good, right, even the club goes through years gone by when the, the, the money wasn't there, right? I think fans, most most of us are realistic. We go, right, fair enough. We've, we've no got a large surplus of cash in the bank, right? Money's a bit tighter. We've got to just, you know, start to generate cash again, whatever it may be. Be creative. We get that. But see when the club, even by their own interim interim account statement, say that they failed, the club failed by hoarding so much cash, right, as part of the interims that came out a few months ago. Mm-hmm. And that's only increased now. That figure's gone up again because all the season ticket and then we've got a new expanded Champions League, which will be this six months accounting period coming up. And they've made profits and players get sold giant, which is fine. That's actually a good, good model. But when the club's going to be sitting the best party, £100 million, Questions should be asked to say, come on, we, we get it. We get it. you don't want to go mad. And you, you think a player's worth six million. And the club's selling them think he's worth 15. We get it. Don't, you don't pay 15. But there's got to be a case where sometimes you just say, right, we're not going to go to 15. But if somebody's worth six, they know we've got cash. We'll maybe offer eight. And I think it's just Celtic, when you're so cash rich, how much value would it bring to the team and the squad and the manager and the fans? to get a player in for the start of pre-season, take them on tour to America, to say this is a statement of intent, you know? And we yep. still, those running the clubs, still don't have the same aspirations, ambitions. We'll have to do the hide it very well. Yeah, right? so right. So if I, if I take you back to 2023, when Rogers, uh, this one for you, Ralph, take you back to 2023, when Rogers was signed, uh, Michael Nicholson, uh, the strategy has always been clear. We want to be a world-class football club in whatever we do. We we invest what we can for today, tomorrow and the long term. There is no significant change. We all want the same thing, which is to win. 
Do you think? Do you have any confidence in Mister Nicholson Ralph at this point in time? <coughs> no, none, none whatsoever on him. But I think that what Rogers is doing is I, I think he's identified his targets. I think he's pretty much told the board how much to go to anything more than that. It's his responsibility after all spending money as such. I think he's told them that's what we'll go to, that's what we'll offer them. And there's a possibility that the players themselves are hesitating. Quality players will always wait as long as they can to see what, what else is out there, what else comes along. And he's probably caught between a rock and a hard place. To go back to that interview, he didn't. It certainly didn't look like he was bullshitting, but he looked a wee bit more relaxed than you would expect somebody who's not brought people in and who knows he's going to get criticised, although to an extent the support will always criticise the board. And the other thing to think about as well, you were saying that the transfer the market hasn't kind of kicked in yet. A lot of the English clubs are operating in the red and they can't move, like you said, until they sell players. It's not what it used to be a few years back. After a major tournament like the Euros, you would expect players to be moving virtually on a daily basis, and they haven't been. It's it's just not taken off, and it could be due to a lack of money, and that might explain why clubs like Norwich are trying to get above a uh, above what is worth for for Ida. I still think they'll get Ida, uh, and I think we'll get another. No, sorry, I was going to say back again, like, it's come back to that, do as I say, uh, do as I do, not as I say, or whatever. Uh, we we, 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 we all ball all these clubs. As the sector says, if we, if we if we think I does worth six and they want eight, I'm going to say, here's seven, just take the seven yeah. and we'll give you an extra 10% if we sell them. Get the deal done. Don't fuck about for a million pounds. But, but Desi, I think, I think Norwich were asking for 12. Oh, but I right. get because it's, it's all, it's all yeah. negotiation bullshit, right? Mm-hmm. They knew how important he was for us, and Rogers wants so him. He's developing there. We can all see it. He's, he's done really well for us. If you want to offer Celtic, Celtic would never offer Celtic. Fair. That. We Celtic, offer, Celtic offer four, right? And Norwich go, he's 12. Celtic's yeah. got a value. They'll probably go, we think he might get six. But if they only want to drop the price for 12 until he takes a strop, either doesn't go on a plane, you know, and almost forces Norwich hands to get the player doesn't want to be there, then Celtic come in and go, well, he's six. So so that's so 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 again I'm playing devil's advocate here. That's that could be the Atalanta perspective of there's fourteen for Matt O'Reilly, no. There's fifteen, no. Seventeen, maybe we're final offer, no. All the while Matt O'Reilly, I know Matt O'Reilly is no unsettled, but as an example of a player being getting unsettled, suddenly it's like just let them know we are willing to give him double his wages or whatever, and suddenly you know how that, that world works. And before you know it, then it's like here in Rumbles, he's, he's a wee bit upset. I mean, and a wee bit uncertain then. Before you know it, it's like, here's 18, we'll take it. But you wanted 25. No, that's an idea. But, but Ralph's point about the market not taking off, and you mentioned Atalanta, Desi. I forget the player, but Juventus are trying to buy an Atalanta midfielder, right? And this is the guy, and this is why Atalanta want to get Matt O'Reilly to, to come in and replace that guy. But Juventus have low-balled Atalanta. Yeah. Went, get to fuck. And Atalanta's low-balled us, and we went, get to fuck. And we've low-balled Norwich and they went, get to fuck. So there's this recurring theme here about teams low-balling teams early in the transfer right. window and get so, told to get to fuck. So a question of physics, does a low-ball roll uphill or downhill? What way does a low-ball <laughs> roll? <coughs> right, before well, I Maybe that's just the way the market is now. Yeah, By the way, folks, there's just not as much money about cakes where, where we're talking here. <laughs> I did, I did, I'm eating a lovely egg custard tart beer my, my mother-in-law gave me it was fucking six of them you greedy cunt this is not this the one this is not, this, this another quote for Brendan in the day we had a good squad last season but it needed to improve, we needed to improve on that we know what we need to do and this is this is one for you Hector because I know you love the Brendanisms I'm not getting I'm not getting bogged down by the negative toxic energy oh, of, yeah. that comes around transfers we know as a club what we need to do, what we need to improve, and we have just under four weeks to do that. So there, he's draw, he's drew the line in the sand and said, "Get those guys out of line." You see, so you see, you read, see you reading that out, right? You read that out, which is absolutely because I, I watched it. But it's interesting. See if you watch it and hear him saying those words, you get a bit of context. It wasn't a finger pointing, being stern and pulling a face. He was actually quite relaxed and chilled talking about it. Although reading those words. It doesn't quite sound as if that would be the case. But anyway, Ralph watched it as well. He, he was very quite relaxed at it. 
one thing for me though, right? And, and again, it's who the manager wants. But we've spoken about this before. I look at players and think we need more than another striker. Probably need two strikers, right? There's a guy in Aberdeen, Yovsky. What is he? Twenty three year old. He's he's like a year done below fantastic. Either. Done two great seasons at Aberdeen. He's an international. He scored against us. Played really scored against them. We Aberdeen, who haven't been even the third best team in Scotland, have been woeful, and he's consistently scoring goals against us. He scored goals in Europe for Aberdeen last season. And I was thinking, I'd be fucking signing him in the heartbeat. But I get it. It's up to the manager and his coaching staff who they want. It's not who I want as a fan, right? So, that, uh, again, but that, that's, that is also part of the question. I think a lot of people are asking, we go for Ida. We get, we, I'm not, this, let's say, the transfer is more convoluted. I was going to say we get messed about, but that might be, un, that might be unfair to Norwich. The transfer, the transfer does not go as smoothly as we all hoped. So then we go, right, so how long do you persist? Do you, do you wait until Ida starts forcing a transfer and, and say we've got another couple of weeks, we don't need to be in a rush? Or, as you say, Hector, there's another viable target right up the road there. Do we just go, right, thanks very much, Ida, we're going to... Now we're going to try and get Miofsky. A lot of us would like to get both of them, but that would not happen. But yeah. you wonder why they don't do that. But Ralph, Ralph, let's move on. We we have signed two keepers. Rangers have let their best keeper go. Connor Goldson has went to Cyprus. Are you okay, Ralph? Because that's <laughs> half of your diary. That's half of your diary away from next year. And, uh, the the thing with them is, but the, they've lost pretty much. Six or seven first team players. They've signed and nine players. Obviously, that's well, they've signed nine players. Eight of them are fucking nineteen year old. <laughs> I, I, I think you might be getting. I, I think you might be getting the, the the players are signing mixed up with the guys that are coming in to do work in the ground because <laughs> the they, they're not exactly what you would call well known names, are they? That's it. Even Clements come out and says, "When was the last time Celtic signed a well known name?" Be honest, James McCarthy. Casper Schmeichel. Oh, I, I, that was a fee transfer. Well, it oh, no. doesn't matter. He's, he's 37. It doesn't matter. It's a, it's a free transfer because yeah. he was a right, okay, contract. Right, okay, right, okay, I stand correct. Joe, Joe Hart was Michael's quite well known as well. Right, no bother. That's fine. I don't, I, 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 not, be careful. Hold on, hold on. There's top star names. There's people you know. And there's complete fucking strangers off the street. They've signed, fucking, they've, signed, they've signed people for fucking junior leagues over the summer, right? Uh, One guy for Holland, the rest are fucking, what are they, playing for fucking shucks and juniors and all that? Let's move on. <laughs> Again, I'm just saying, just be careful. I mean, like, people in glass houses, we have signed one guy last night uh, and then two keepers, you know what I mean? And we're still clearly one team. Well, that's that's the other thing that we do, but we get them in on loan for 12 months. Usually we're an option to buy, which is somebody's made an answer that way, Adam Ida. Yeah. And when they when they settle in, when they play quite well, we sign them full time. So that's what's happened to Paolo Bernardo. The only delay there that I could possibly see was that Benfica didn't want to end up losing a lot of money again the way that they did with Yotta. So they were obviously hanging on to try and get as much as they can out of the deal and a bigger percentage and whatever. But I think we'll get a couple of players on loan again. That's what scared me when we played Manchester City. You know, in case Peter Law was hanging around and with our manager asking him if they get any sort of up and coming players we can get again. We'll get a couple on loan for somewhere. It'll be an option to buy, and it's a gradual kind of increase in the quality. But what supporters are demanding is an immediate increase. And that's a kind of risky business. Yeah, well, uh, just know, you don't know, know what you're let, me cut, let me cut you off there, because I, I think that's a bit harsh also on supporters. Yeah. By saying demanding, I think assuming, like I think we all assumed we were we were moving up, we were gradually make, moving up the steps and we got to the next level. Rogers had come back, he clearly had demands on quality and we were going to step up that quality. I think we assumed it would be a lot quicker than it's been, so... Barbara, not like that way. I don't think it's us demanding it. I think the whole thing is, as a club, we should be demanding it. You yeah. know what I mean? It's the expectation as well, isn't it, Ralph? I mean, if you think about it, we, we finished the season at the end of May and the scouts were removed after the, the dreadful January and the last summer's window, right? Law's boy was booted out with Rogers, right? 
he's brought in some other other scouts. Uh, we spoke about this in the last podcast, I think, or two before that. But they've had the best part of two months plus to get. And the first outfield player they bring in is one that was with us. Good player, I think he's a good player, the boy. But you've got to give the fans a bit of fucking, you know, come on, here, a bit of aspiration here. We've got loads of cash. You know, don't have six players in the room. We get that, but there should be somebody in before now. I get getting two or three towards the end of the window. That's just normal football practice in the transfer window. But there's really nothing to stop us getting at least one good quality player in early in the transfer window. <laughs> then you bring then you bring in Bernardo. Great. Add Mida for what it's worth. I think, I think he's lined up probably next week. He'll sign for us. That's just, just my view on it. But we should have brought somebody in just to give the fans a lift. And here we mean business. And right. And not to do that again. I think it's quite lazy in Celtic's part. Yeah, there, there, there we there, say it, Ralph. Always, yeah. Ralph. Ralph, dare I say it, there isn't a buzz about the place at the moment. No, there is always so, a feeling. No, I'm just, I'm just asking, as in transfer-wise, like the whole transfer yeah. anticipation you were talking about there. The, the scary I, thing is that with them, with them not performing at the level that their fans expect, is that we're kind of rewinding to just doing enough to keep the champions league money coming in and we're still building a uh, we're a business rather than a football club yeah which we, we've that, always said anyway so I, so i think, I think that's, a, you know, that's a very good point i think the fear factor is still simmering under there are we just doing enough to keep them at an arm's length rather than yeah. what we always assumed was we would put our boot on their neck and actually push them down for i mean get them down to their hearts and aberdeen level Here's the thing, right? I'm thinking yeah. out loud here with us, right? Because of all the cash we've got in the bank, which has never happened, it may never happen again in the history of the club, right? This is our once in a generation, couple of generations opportunity for proper structural change with the stadium. The South Stand has been always, 1970 was built, what's that now, 54, 55 year old. That's going to get replaced sooner rather than later. See if the club came out and went, by the way, supporters, just so you know, and they might do that the next four weeks or so when they're due to release their, their, their full year figures, which was the end of June, wasn't it? They might say, by the way, we realise this has to get done. We think it's going to cost us, I'm making a figure up here, circa £80 million. Pounds. We're, we're trying to keep some kind. See if they did that, you'd at least then understand part of the logic for keeping back a lot of the cash. But it's the fact he's mentioned Michael Nicholson. I cannot remember the last time Michael Nicholson stood up as chief executive and spoke to the fans about the direction of the club, the strategy, what the three-year plan is, the five-year plan. I don't know about you guys, but he's been invisible. Yeah. No. Oh, God knows. And as a chief there executive, isn't a long-term plan, should, is there? But, but as a chief there executive, he should be, he should be addressing anything. supporters. But should, that's my point, though. He should yeah. be addressing supporters. People say, he's the chief exec, and he's, he's invisible. And for me, that's, that's frustrating. He should be out there saying, look, this is the plans. There's nothing. Nothing Ralph, good. Ralph, Ralph, the strategy has always been clear to be a world class football club in whatever we do. That is the plan. <laughs> right, right, so, right, so let's just quick look. Oh, well, that's, that. that's all right. Well, for a minute there, I was worried. Ah, right. fuck it, he's right. Right, right so we're brought in, we're brought in two, <laughs> two keepers, we're brought in two keepers, which, we, which is good to see because we did need to replace Joe Hart and a succession plan, which is good. Uh, get rid of. Sigrist, which who nobody would even recognise, I don't think. Bernardo. I thought he'd, I thought he'd already gone. No. I was dead just... shocked to see him lining up in one of their games. Yeah. I, I was pretty sure they'd get rid of him because his girlfriend went away or something. Aye. Uh, I think he, he became famous but, as but basically a, a, a wag. He basically became a beard or whatever. Yeah. Uh, then Wanker. Bernardo. <laughs> Bernardo. The only fear is Bernardo is the succession plan for O'Reilly, but at least he's he's. Had a season, scored a couple of very important goals and contributed to the season and the cup win. So that's I think that's a very good signing, to be fair. Right, but yep. we've only Hector, we've only got one forward. We've not got any recognised decent centre halves to partner Carter Vickers. And even talking about there about there's four weeks to go in the window. Apparently the night, as an example, I'm not saying this was somebody we should have signed, but as an example, Scott McKenna, a free Scottish if he's got his centre half, apparently he's gone to Las Palmas. I mean, so you wonder, like that. I know that that may have been an easy target, and we might be aiming for a bigger, M- bigger McKenna would have been that, a, but that seemed that seemed a quick goal. That seemed yeah, a quick yeah, I'm, I'm, 
I, I, I get it from the European because that's something we've all got to remember that we need to have a certain number of homegrown yeah. Scottish players. Mm-hmm. And a guy who was out of contract, who's an international, who's played in the EPL, to be fair to him, uh, with Forrest. And the Champions League. Got him, aye, and you'd have okay. got him for, for, you know, obviously it's three transfers, you'll get a last signing on fee, probably bigger wages, but it was almost like, well, he could be one of your three or four centre-halves, you know, might yeah. be the start mm-hmm. next to Carter Vickers. Well, just might have somebody else in mind, but he'd be your third centre-half who could rotate them, because Carter Vickers the last couple of years to a few injuries. Yeah. But you obviously want probably oh. three really strong centre-backs, bearing in Carter Vickers' injury status, with Scales perhaps being the fourth centre-back, if that makes sense. Yeah. And you're right, I'm kind of with you. But he's my first choice, no, he's no. But in terms of just building your squad, it probably made a bit of sense. Mm-hmm. No. Yeah. Same, same as when we got Stephen Presley, wasn't it? They wouldn't have been Energy's first choice, but he was reliable, dependable, Scottish for Europe, and he he didn't let anybody down. Never uh, a man of the match. But... He's uh, a <laughs> <Stanley Bagley, obviously. laughs> but no, but, but uh, well, he, he was I'm, somewhere I'm, between Pish and man of the match. Yeah, I'm, 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 <laughs> we're, we're no, we're no, we're no, we're no portraying the Scott McKenna sell as a supporters club here. It's just the fact that he's a he's another example of. Well, maybe he was a Celtic backup plant, and suddenly that's out the window. Not why suddenly all your all your targets start to go somewhere else, and then meet the yeah, classic. Yeah, you, 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 you go to your next yeah, in yeah. line, then you go to your next in line, and before you know it, you're going to Man City for a low knee under twenty one player. No, I mean that kind of thing. Just calling Johnny Kenny back for Shamrock. Oh, well, was that yeah. kind of exactly? So that's what we want to hope that they're, they're clearly well, going to avoid. But, but, I think but, that's what but, Rogers is trying to make sure they don't do. Well, but, so, but, I, accounts, we made an we made an offer to Burnley for their centre half, didn't we? Um, that that's the one that the clubs apparently made an offer for, and Burnley's rejected it. I don't know the amount. I think that's the play that Rogers is, is keen to bring in. Irish centre half at, at Burnley. Um, I, I forget the guy's name. Really Shea, somebody, Dara Shea, Dara Shea, something like that. Is that the Irish boy? Right. Yeah. He's, he's a Burnley, Burnley centre half. I've yeah. never heard of him, to be honest with you. He's a guy apparently Rogers is, is keen to bring in. Yeah, and apparently we've also run discussions with Royal Antwerp's Mikkel and Balakwisha. Balakwisha. Uh, but apparently we're lowballing him. Antwerp are no entertaining <laughs> our low. Uh, Antwerp are no entertaining <laughs> our low offers. Uh, so again, clubs should have a talk this week to make progress apparently. So again, things are happening, but it's a bit frustrating that we're kicking off tomorrow and we've got one striker and we're still who relying. Who does the negotiating? Who, 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 who's who's actually out there who, sitting who with knows? the representatives of these Antwerp? We assume well, that, yes, because whoever it is obviously hasn't been doing it for very long simply because of no, the news. It's, it's, it's people, has that been right? a mistake getting rid of guys that did it before? No, they've they never, they never done it very well with the Scouts, ones that have done it. Scouts don't, don't do the negotiation, right? They'll identify the players and put them in front of the manager. Then yeah. they'll say, right, yeah. When it comes to negotiation and, and closing the deal, there's two people who, in effect, sign off the checks. Nicholson is the main chief exec, so he'll be involved in any significant outlay. But the person that does the contractual signing off the checks is Mackay, who's the chief financial officer. So they're the two people who, in effect, close the deals. <laughs> the club. Would yeah. you not think that Brendan would be sitting talking to them trying to sell them the club? And he'd maybe take Aye. along somebody else? To, that's what but I would he, do. But he won't, I'm with you, Ralph, but he won't say to a player, so for example, we mentioned uh, whoever, Scott McKenna, out of contract, came for the EPL and it's Forest. So we might say, well, he might be the top 30k out of contract, came for the EPL, 30k a week, but he may be wanting 60k a week. Rogers can he then mm. say, We'll give you 50 because it's not really his. He can give a recommendation, I think, to the board about the value of a player and the wages of a player based on his experience. But ultimately, it's the bean counters who, who control the purse strings, isn't it? Yeah. And, and, and to be honest, if if you were a player at Celtic that was played every week and there was a guy coming in as a reserve defender getting 20 or 30 grand a week more than you, you're upsetting the equilibrium of the dressing room, to coin a phrase. And that kind of, uh, you need to be careful when you're bringing in players. That uh, one of the things I've noticed in the American tour is we played a lot more like a team than we did do even towards the end of last season. They all seem to be getting on a wee bit better and know where everybody should be, and they were looking out for each other a bit more. And if uh, it's a delicate balance, if he's taken 12 months to get it to that stage, the hesitation might be because he doesn't want to upset that. So I think there's a number of variables. 
as opposed to can spend I, the money and get this guy whatever on you I can I just say Ralph just the the, the Brendan the, the one there's the one Brendan Bozut today the one today and it was right early on in the the, the, the interview he was watching on YouTube and he was talking about how the team had done in preparation and he was really happy Ralph's point really really happy he was after come on real leaps and bounds and he says <laughs> this is great he goes so much so he goes that we're playing one of the games against one of the English teams, it was Chelsea, I think it was, and he said, in the opposition bench, somebody I knew really well, come over and said, that's a proper Brendan team. Uh, oh, I, fucking hell, man. Oh, fucking hell. That's a good thing. I've played one before. <laughs> fucking great. <laughs> <laughs> it, it does, it, it's obviously doing a lot more than just coaching them. You can see that. Uh, and... If he has happy, if he's happy enough with what he's got, and he, but he's not because you can tell that for that interview. But he'll accept it if it's what he's got. And there's not going to be any tantrums. There's not going to be any whatever. And we'll just he'll just get on with it. But we can't change it. I'm so glad you said that. Ralph. I am so but glad. But we can't change it, can we? To your point at the start, exactly. About old familiar and stuff like that. We 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 know we've got the scars. All I'm going to do is rather than. And get myself worked up and ultimately over nothing because they are what they are, they're in the club. I'm yeah. just going to have to hope, cross the fingers, cross the toes, that by the end of August, we've got maybe four or five new players, maybe two or three first team players, a couple to, to bolster the squad, and see if we don't. Well, I'll be shocked based on the last, what, 20 years? No. It, 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 you know, as with, as with the people running the club. Okay, okay. Seeing as we are a consistent podcast and we are a consistent <laughs> club, I need to ask a, what, the, what is now a consistent question. Do we think the current manager will be there for season number three of his contract? Uh, well, okay. well, we'll be talking next year about Brendan's team tomorrow for the first game of the season. I think so, I because he looks a wee bit more relaxed than what he did in his previous uh, term here. I, whether or not he's accepted what the club is and accepted how it, how it all works, because that was quite startling. Uh, Ange Postecoglou said that Celtic have a way of doing things and boy, do they stick to it, which could have been a reference to anything, but it could have been a reference to maybe limiting his ambitions. Whereas Rogers went away and he's come back. He knows what he can back into. He might well have said, but we need to do this, we need to do that. If circumstances have changed since then, it looks more like he's accepted it. And I think he'll be here right up until the minute somebody else wants him. That's, that's not the same thing, Ralph, but that's, that's so... so <laughs> no, I, 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 I think he'll be here. Hector, I think I'm quite he'll surprised because you, you were obviously mulling that over, that question. No, and I've got an answer. And, and what, what was mulling over is, I was going to ask you guys the question, but I think I know the answer, is he signed a three-year contract, didn't he? Yeah. So I, think he'll see, I, th- I, I, I think he'll see the three years. I think three years. Uh, so I, an answer to Matt for me is yes. I think he's three oh, years, no. and I can't, you know, I think that'll be it. I think because he walked out the last time, I think this time be three seasons, and that'll be, that may well be it. I I I will I will again. It's been as since as I yeah. was since I was the person that did warn you about Ange no making season number three. I will say I don't think Brendan Rodgers will be there for next season. Purely the way if purely the way things are going at the moment, he's doing every he's playing the diplomat. But as Ralph said, they came back and think accepted things. But I don't think he. I think he. It was in Mallorca and he was told, you're the man, you're, you're the guy that directs this stuff and it's not being executed as, if they can get their act together, fine, but I don't have any trust in Celtic's board getting their act together enough, to be honest. It's not, I'm not blaming Brendan Rodgers here, I'm blaming the board, you know what I mean? I'm not having a go at Rodgers, but can there's, I just only so much, there's only so much a Class A coach can take before he goes, fuck this. And there's also, Crazy. I've always said, English FA... Is always sniffing about Rogers. Daisy, for our one listener, George, can I just say to our one listener, 
it's no surprise in the cusp of a season going for four in a row that Desi comes back with the negativity I... yet again. <laughs> Only, and that's what happens when you live in the south side of Glasgow, folks. Not the real part of Glasgow. Not for the clays, the real part of Glasgow. It's this envy, green-eyed mo- He's got this negativity that, honestly, that's what the south stand show brigade. And the listen, does to you. It creates this listen, one. Happy, <laughs> listen, happy clappers, right? I somebody has to stand on the bridge of, so, somebody has to stand on the bridge of realism <laughs> noon again and say stop getting gas stop letting the club gaslight you right don't 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 say no, it's no, fine. No. right but all no, right, no. as I say I'm not having a good Rogers I'm just saying if things continue the way they are and the board don't get their act together then I wouldn't be surprised if Rogers does not make it next season and right. come Quite. to come displays by the board I don't, not think, just... I don't think he will I think. Like you can see, if the dominoes start to fall, for example, English FA apparently want Eddie Howe. So if Eddie Howe was to go to the English, the English job, then the Newcastle job becomes free. Maybe he will not get that, but he might be a contender for whoever moves to get the Newcastle job and whatever he leaves. Well, I'm there not you so go, I... folks. Start of a new campaign and Desi's got Brendan. He hasn't kicked a ball yet. <laughs> and he's got and, and, and and I, not, and I not just built and designed his own new house in Lennox Town? He has three million so, pounds. He's, he's, got three, he's got a three million pound house in London. He's got a three. He's, he's got a two million pound house in Never forgiven him for leaving the last time. Wants him out the door, folks. He, he's a man. <laughs> he's a man full right. of spite. Right. Right. Exactly. Right. The so, so, there you go. Talking about. I tell you what. Talking about. No, hold on. If talking Brendan comes neg- out. Talking about negative Celtic fans. Sunday, <laughs> Sunday the league starts. Flag day, flag day, Ralph. And here he goes. Negative. I'm glad to say I, I, I'm glad to say I won't be there because I've got a christening. Thanks to my nephew. Thanks very much, Kim. Uh, I'll no be. I'll no be there for flag day. <laughs> He's even blaming his nephew now. Ah, <laughs> uh, so I'll be in Hamilton. But flag day. Hey, well. Jim, 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 Craig, one, Craig, Jim Craig's unfurling the flag. Ralph, do you believe Celtic fans will boo on Sunday? Yes or no? No. Not unless Brendan comes out and says he's here for 10 in a row, because that would be a certain sign he's away in a couple of weeks. Hey, we need to be careful with Kilmarnock, by the way. European backlash after they just get knocked out. Uh, they've only they've started started already. Already. No, they're still in Europe. No, they're, they're still in the conference. They play in the conference. And I spoke to a guy I work with. He's a Kelly fan. They've only got two defenders apparently for tomorrow for Sunday's game, but they play in the conference. Well, we can lend them a couple. They get, <laughs> I, well, I, I actually told them it will be both in Lawwell gone on alone at the end of this window, so to speak. End of, but apparently, Kilmarnock have only got two defenders: one suspended, one's injured. But they also play well, next week only... in the con. They play next week in the conference qualifier. Hector, what about you? You'll be there. Do you think? Will you be booing or will you be cheering on? Oh, he's... Fuck off with your fish. <laughs> Just want the fucking league in the double. We come back. Great the last three months. Great pre-season. Fans are buzzing. First game of the season. If any cunt goes, I'm going to boot on the boys. There you go on Sunday. Right, right. I am. Okay. I will be. I will be. We've just out. signed one of the best players at the Euros as well. Come on, put a smile on your face. Boot on, let's, 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 I don't like Boot. Let's not go over the top with one of the best players at the Euros, Casper Michael Geezer. Well, let's not go OTT here. All right, uh, name another better Danish goalkeeper. What, <laughs> what are we going to do? If, if, you, if you can name another what Danish we, keeper. Desi, what are we doing? <laughs> what are we doing? We're doing the boards and a lack, lack of signings. But, 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 but the board's not going to be in the pitch. But, how, so who have we booed before? We've always booed the boards. We never moved the person no. unfurling the flag. No, no. Jim moved, Craig's unfurling the flag. It's what about Fergus McCann? You moved him. That's because you kept John <laughs> Brown, who was a cunt. So, <laughs> we're not booing Brendan. We're not booing the league title. We're booing the oh, board's lack of activity. You're, you're doing a job with the fucking sun and the daily record. I am, uh, I'm asking a question. Seriously? I'm asking a question. That's a stupid question. Right, okay, right. So we'll see. <laughs> we will see, right? We will <laughs> see what happens. No, we won't. It's not going to happen. I'm not be there, so I'll not see it, but you'll hear Aye, it. So you don't, you don't hear fuck. I'm going to boo you. See the next fucking podcast. <laughs> I'm going to hear you talking and go, boo. That's <laughs> just to you. On this podcast, that is going to be the daftest fucking question you've ever asked any of us. There's devil's advocate, and there's just mad. I, I, I'm t- I'm boo. T- I am telling no, you. We'll boo if you come out and score. We'll boo, right? If you can't go one or up, you'll get boos, right, fans? But nobody's going to boo fucking... Jim Craig, 
I'm not booing Jim Craig. To be fair, supporters have got a long memory. He gave away a penalty in that game. I think Jim Craig has been rolled out to make sure they don't boo. Aye. You hear Ralph's point there. I mean, he's getting booed for that penalty. <laughs> is that a, and apparently, apparently they gave somebody a bad feeling in 1977. That's what you... I, you I, just, I just say, the next game, Tessie's going to be sitting there with a wee placard, sack somebody. No, I've, got, I've got my megaphone. I'm just going to keep going, boo! The one of the Vuva Zellers. That'll be me constantly. So I'm just asking the question... We'll wait and see. No, I think you'll be surprised. No. Not everyone's so a I'm happy looking clapper. Forward. I'm looking forward. I'm looking forward to something. I have to. I have uh, to agree to great. an extent it's with you. Great. I agree Go to ahead, an Ralph. extent with you. There's an awful negativity. You know, like all the Celtic media. You know, the the other websites, uh, the other blogs, whatever you want to call them. There's an them. awful line of uh, what do you call it? Negativity running through them. Sack the board, why are they not spending the money? It, it's almost as though they, they're thinking, right, we've got this money, we need to spend it on somebody. There's no kind of... but It's not constructive criticism, it's just kind of moaning. And it, it gives the impression that they're the kind of people that go into Asda and pay three times as but much as what the bill says. Yeah, again, because I they've got a wee bit of money. I appreciate what you're saying, Ralph, but I still think it's justified criticism. So I mean, I, I do think they, I think they deserve criticism, given the fact that it's been they've had so long to get deals done, and for reasons that we don't know, maybe their communication could be better. To as Hector discussed earlier on, maybe there's reasons that we're not committing large amounts of money immediately. So that's fine, but we don't know. So that's that that kind of unknown. We don't know. So that generates the fear, that generates the anger, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yoda, here we go. That leads to uncertainty, blah blah blah. So I think that's part of it. But I think there is a lot of I think there's a lot of kind of no. anger out there, to be honest. I think no, no, but I think I think we're agreeing. But it's there's kind of different aspects to it, right? I think the first thing is I don't know anyone who's really happy with the board and their lack of ambition. Not just this summer, but but previous summer. I think everyone there's almost a unanimous agreement on that, right? I don't think. There's probably various levels of anger, but that's life in general. You get folk who are always fucking raging. There's a couple of sitting mm. in Celtic Park. Aye, right. <laughs> but there's others who are just practicing. fucking by, by aye, how they act, right? And they lack ambition, we know that. But there's also the club's just won three in a row. We're getting the flag at the weekend. It's the first game since the end of May. So for me, there's an actual excitement. I think the only chance any booze on Sunday will be if we get beat. And that's a normal reaction. If it gets the full time command at beat is one nothing, then you'll get fucking booze. That always is the case. But I don't see anybody genuinely Desi, I'm 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 no I'm no idea here. I don't see mm-hmm. I've not spoke to anybody, I know anybody where that starts even cross their mind. I just don't no, not a chance. Zero. See? Zero. So both criticism fine, sorry Desi, both criticism absolutely you know me. I'm one of the biggest critics of fucking the guys running the show are running it really poorly in my opinion. But I, I'm just happy for the weekend to start. Football to start. I think there's a bit of positivity with the club over yeah. the summer months. I think we're getting a bit of a high on the field with the manager and the players after a really good pre-season. We take it on. Then I'd like to think well, we've got three weeks left, four weeks left. We'll see a few new players in and see if we don't come the end of August. Then I think you'll see a lot of fucking rage at that point, Desi. I think absolutely. There'll be a lot of rage at that point. But I don't think the first game in this, right now is the time to doing that. No, don't see mm. it. See, but like, again, you did, you did touch on something there. Again, and this brings it full circle, that it's the hope that kills, because every year we hope that they're going to get better. They're going to do better than they did last year. But then every season, the board disappoint again, so to speak. You know, like, we make assumptions that we've got money in the bank, we've got players identified, let's go and get them. No, we're not going to get them. We're going to have to wait to the last minute of the window to fill in all these positions. And it's like, surely no next year. Yep, next year, the exact same thing. And I think it's that frustration, that sign think, of frustration. If we are going to get a backlash uh, from the support towards the board, it'll come in the early stages of the Champions League. It's, what, what is it, eight games this time? Well, and again, if we're kind of out 
if we if we're out of it after three or four games, you that is going to be a, a bit of a nightmare because you're getting three or four meaningless games after that, and that that could backfire tremendously. And I don't know if the I don't know if the board are thinking that far ahead, but when that tournament comes around, we need to be ready and we need to hit the ground running. It's a good, that's a a good point, Ralph. So you've that, four, that's going to be a nightmare, that is. Right, so you've got four home that, games. That, see what you've done. One question, and you've brought us all down to your Listen, level. Negative, man. I'm, negative, I'm, yeah. already, I've already what, what got beaten the, the, the Champions say? League with them in September. They tried, to, they tried to bury my negativity, but didn't know it was seeds. That's what I'm saying. Right, well, right, right. Again, talking about, the, talk, talk, talking, about, talking about the Champions League, it's four home games this year. So the board have also got to market that and sell that. How much is that going to be, do you think? £160? 200, 200, 200 quid. There you go. So there you go. So if, if they've not signed anybody decent and they've no back then that's a big that's a big hill to climb. Right, so let's go for predictions. Ralph, come on up on Sunday. What's your predictions? Well, you said they've only got two defenders, yeah. but we've mm-hmm. only got one striker, so we're still heavily outnumbered. Uh, as usual with these occasions, the, the football kind of tends to be dull. So I think we'll just win one or two nothing. I don't think it'll be any any great shakes. So it'll just be a... Uh, just be a routine game. I don't think, unless yeah, of course. Uh, the, I tell you what. I tell you what. My hope is for the see is your man Nicholas Coon. He's looked good in the in the friendlies. Mm-hmm. He's looked like he's settled in a wee bit more, and he looks like he's got something different to offer. So, I, I think that there is still a wee bit more optimism than pessimism. But I don't think it'll be any great game. I think they'll just get the job done and come away with it. Okay, nice. So that's, uh, seven, so that's a definite. That's the definite seven nil then. Because I'm saying. Uh, I, I, the one I'm you the complete, complete opposite from Ralph. I, I think there's a lot of positivity on the field to be over the summer months, and mm. I think they'll take that into the season. Uh, Rio's mm. compared to last year, we've got Rio, and we've got O'Reilly and Calmac together. You mentioned uh, Nicholas Kuhn there. And I think we will see a really good Celtic performance. I think we'll thump Kilmarnock 5 0 on Sunday. Oh, that's interesting because I, I, I was thinking 5 1. I was thinking 5 1 myself. I was thinking, uh, give them a goal. Oh, what's, 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 what's the wee winger guy? Is it Alan somebody? No, Armstrong. Is it Armstrong? Armstrong. Armstrong. Aye, I'll, 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 I'll go for him. He's, I think I'll allow him a go against this. Uh, I, I was going to go for 5-1. Because me being so, Mr. Naturally Positive, I'm thinking we'll get at least five goals. So I'm looking forward to watching that from you've my nephew's telly. You've done it, Ralph, from the fucking last ten minutes. <laughs> he's, he's sitting in a dark car, everyone. He's, <laughs> he's even put the flag out, so he's I in just the first time, That's the first time I've ever predicted 7 goals for any game in about the last ten years. Right. You've, you've, right. you've destroyed me. Right, so as a, as a wrap up, as a wrap up, season predictions. Uh, Hector, you mentioned earlier, Brendan was already saying winning the three trophies available and also uh, making roads in Europe. And he was his face. There's no bones about it. He said, he said something to basically let's not be not, let's not be about the bush. That's what he said. Let's not be about yeah. the bush. We've been disappointed. Underachieved. And it's, got, yep. it's not good enough. Underachieved. So, um, Desi, let's start with you. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, I, no, I think I think there's already. No, because been... that'll affect ours. Right, so the time he's finished, ours is relegated. I'm thinking there's a very good chance we could go have another invincible season, right? Oh, so we, we go through the domestic Can season. Are you signings? Are you sure? <laughs> I know. I, uh, four, we've got four weeks to get these big signings, mate. Four weeks. We're getting them. Four weeks. We're... You see the snow. You see the snow. Hector, Hector, we've moved on. You can one, mate. You can't have language in the past. Just <laughs> so we, went for booing them to an invincible season. <laughs> They're going to move on, Hector. So I'm going to go for an invincible season. Tom Roddick comes back in January and then seals the deal against Aberdeen <laughs> in the last game at Hamden. 
Uh, so that would be nice. Rangers don't get back to Ibrox at all the whole season, which would be hilarious. Uh, so I'll go for that. Europe, I think we'll be rotten again because we're always rotten. So I don't expect anything at all in Europe. Uh, I don't know the new format, how bad we can possibly be and still continue in Europe. But as Ralph always says, it's a long time since we had Fortress Parkhead. So I don't see that returning very soon. So ask me, I'm going invincible domestic, rotten in Europe. There's my prediction. Ralph, beat that. I, I mean, the, you, you're gonna, you would be absolutely off your head if you didn't think we would win the league. There's always a bad performance that can cost you a couple of Kilmarnock last year. So another treble would be nice, but again, the, last year showed how difficult that is. As for Europe, a lot depends on the first couple of games, regardless of whether we've got signings. A lot depends on a uh, last year in the first game. Uh, was it Real Madrid last year? It was, wasn't it? Just that hitting the bar in the first minute to me changed the whole the whole pattern of the game and the campaign. That was the year before, wasn't it? That, that was the year before. Was it? Who who beat us last year? Yeah. You kind of get lost in it. But it was the same kind of thing last year. Oh, aye, aye. And it, again, it was that kind of thing. We were just. We thought we were getting there, but the margins remained as fine as they were the year before. We need a wee bit of a break in the first couple of games to give us the confidence that we can compete at that level. But I think the players are capable of doing it, but I'm not sure that the players themselves think they're capable of doing it. If we get a, a unit that works together, the some of the whole being the greater than the individual parts, etc. We need to get off to a good run in it. If we can do that and get through it, 16 teams out of 24 qualify. If we get into the knockout stages, well, we're due to winning a knockout game sooner or later, aren't we? So we just need to to grow as a Answer team. Answer the keep fucking question. How are we going to do in Europe? Shay, I'm just telling you. <laughs> see, no, I'm you're trying to be positive. Much. I'm trying to be positive, and it's see, not, you've got me booing Jim Craig again. Oh, oh, I think, what, I think what, Ralph, Ralph, it depends on how we start. Right, I think it depends on how we start. We're capable of doing well. It depends if we get the breaks. If you're not in boys, so I'm all right. We're gonna, we're gonna win it. We're gonna win Wimbledon as well that's next year. Fucking merely, right? That's just better, right? And, and and Matt O'Reilly will be the first man on Mars. There you are. For what team? But Jim Craig still get booed. <laughs> right, Hector, what about you? Let's get a bit of realism and drag my bit of realism, Desi, right? I think we'll win the league. I think we'll win the Scottish Cup. And I think we'll win the League Cup. I think oh, we're going okay. to do the treble this year. I think we're going to play... Who's, who, who's, who's, the, who's the first team to beat us? I'm going to... I'm, no, I'm going to go negativity, right? That's your job. <laughs> no, I'm not going to go negativity. See that? I'm, I'm telling you when the treble, you've got to, who's going to beat us. No, no, no. I'm not playing your game. I'm invincible. Right? <laughs> no, 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 no. But you've got me beat. Um, no, no, no. Right, so we're going to win the treble, is my opinion. And I think based upon the last, was it last two and a half to three months of the season where our players were fit, we played really well. It's carried over to the summer. I think we're going to play some really good stuff this season. Um, it'll be good to watch it'll be more like his first season the last time yep. round mm-hmm. he's in charge I think we'll see more of that this year in Europe just to answer your question Desi there's now the exp- it's now 36 teams right and there's four pots with nine teams in a pot and you play two for each so Celtic are in pot four they'll play two for pot four two for pot three it doesn't matter what pot you're in you play two for each pot right and the way it works is the, the, the top is it the top eight of the 36 teams, they get through automatic to the last 16. And the teams that are finished between 9th and 24th, they then play each other in the knockout stage to get through to play the other eight teams. So what that means, if you finish 24th, you'll play 9th. You're 23rd, play 10th, etc. Mm-hmm. So there's a better chance to, to get to the knockout stage. And I get where Rogers is coming from. I think, I think we will get through to the knockout. That's that 9th to 24th. Uh, I think we will. I think we're in for a really good season, a really positive season, um, and I cannot wait for the season to start. Honestly, really looking oh, forward to it. Excellent. Now you, you heard it. You heard it here, folks. Positivity, CSC, and from me, enjoy it while you can, because you'll not be here next year. <laughs> I think the first team to beat us will be Real Madrid. 
And uh, are we getting him again? Are we getting back? Are we getting back to the final? final? We're fucking right, we are. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's so there we are, folks. So we're, we're back, we're officially back. Season 2024 25 officially begins for Celtic on Sunday. The Huns play uh. Hearts of Mora, the wee huns play the big huns of Mora. We don't really care what happens there, but a few injuries would be nice. Funny. Yeah, actually, final uh, question, guys. Sorry, we did this last yep. year. Sorry, Daisy, interrupt. We did this last year. Just don't mind. I'll start with you, Daisy. Who do you think out of the, the players this year will be the most improved player? Remember last year, we all, I think, all agreed you and Anderson, Matt O'Reilly, and we're all, to be fair, we're all 100% spot on. Who do you think out of the squad with the one player who might jump up a level this season? Right. Uh, Ralph, I'm going to allow Ralph Kuhn because he already mentioned him there. Uh, did well. Uh, I'm going to go. I'll go to the other side and hope for the best uh, for Palmer to get his act together. He's bordering on the Cantwell stuff with the dances, etc. But every now and again, he shows the classic. The day flashes a class. So if he can get more consistent, I'd like to hope that Palmer can really step up and kick on. So I'm going to go for Palmer. Ralph, are you sticking with? But Kuhn is the guy you think will push on? I would think, I, I think he's shown signs of it, but I would like to see a defender that's already there improve under Rogers. Somebody like Scales or Welsh to finally realise their potential. I can't see it happening, but I would like to see it happening. But yeah, I'm going to stick with Kuhn because he's starting to look like he's a player. I took, okay. I, Jay, that's two people I was thinking about, but the one I'm, I'm going to go for... Um, and bear in mind he's just in the door is Bernardo um, it might take a few weeks for him to get his fitness up I think over the course of the season I see this is just me I see a lot of similarities in him to Petrov at the start of his Celtic career mm-hmm. I really do I remember Petrov's first season get messed up not messed about a wee bit but he was kind of right back midfield in and out and it wasn't until his second season he adapted with Celtic and he really pushed on I think Bernardo is a box to box midfielder and will he get, get the game time if uh, O'Reilly's still there? Without, without a doubt, I think the rotation's key uh, for, for these guys. And I think he's also got the confidence of the manager. Um, I, I think Bernardo, for me, is going to be the, the, the most improvement this season. OK, there we go. Excellent. So, fingers crossed. So, we've got lots of domestic joy to look forward to. Fingers crossed, all going well. The board will get their... The board will get... Uh, their job to do over the next four weeks. Hopefully by the time we chat again, it'll probably be the end of the transfer window or pre-Huns game. So hopefully we'll know what big signings we've managed to get over the line. Touch wood, that should be fine. To make sure this invincible treble season goes off with us. <laughs> All right, OK. This left for me to say thank you very much to Hector Bandido. Thank you, Hector. Thanks, guys. And thanks again. Good to see you back online, Ralph Mal. Thank you, Ralph. Cheers, thanks very much. I'm not sure whether I'm filled with optimism, hope and joy for the season or it's gone the opposite way, but it's given us plenty to think about. Don't worry, as it used to be. What what show was it you say, and don't have nightmares? I mean, so that's... that should, each of the podcast, the, wasn't it? that should be the tagline for this podcast and don't have nightmares <laughs> as, 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 as usual thank me. thanks very much to everyone for listening and for sticking with us hopefully it's going to be a glorious season uh, we'll join you again very soon probably in the next couple of weeks thanks very much for listening folks my name is Desimon good night right, here we go right, turn your indicator off Ralph bloody shit Ralph what the fuck's that doing Ralph